Good day everyone, thank you for watching this video. My name is Anna and today I'm going to talk about the preliminary classification and origin of the Selkil Lake Copper Silver Occurrence at Nonacho Basin, Northwest Territories. This project is part of my master's thesis at St. Mary's University. To give you a bit of an introduction, Selkil Lake is located 260 kilometers to the east-southeast of Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, and is part of the sedimentary Nonacho Basin. You can see Nonacho Basin here in the lower left corner of the map. Salkid Lake mineralization was first classified by Golden Webb in 1989 as Olympic Dam type mineralization, and later as sediment hosted stratopum copper by Christopher in 1993 during their exploration efforts. Drill core assays from 1994 provide an average of less than 0.2 ppm of silver, about 400 ppm copper, 90 to 120 ppm of lead, and 50 to 70 ppm of zinc. At the time, the data proved to be non-economic, so the interest subsided. No further comprehensive studies and model development has been done after 1994, so the relationship to the uranium rare earth elements showings in the Nacho Basin, age, and type of the mineralization remained unknown. The major objectives of the study is to classify the mineralization, determine what style it is. We also would like to know the timing. When did it form? What is the timing of the formation of the host rocks, the mineralization, and major structural events in relation to the regional geology of the Nanacho Basin? We also need to know fluid and metal source and conditions. What were those conditions of the mineralization? And where did the metals and fluids come from? What were those fluids that carried the metals? Were they magmatic, basinal, seawater? What is their relationship to the uranium rare earth elements mineralization? What is the link to those uranium styles? Are they broadly coeval? related, or just spatially coincident. And of course, the major goal of this study is to start to build a comprehensive and robust model of the mineralization. Now, to talk about the geologic setting. Nanacho is a fold-bound sedimentary basin. First mapped by Eisler in 1985, he determined that the paleo environments were consistent with alluvial fan, braided stream, and lacustrine settings. Sediments of the Nanacho overlay basement rocks. Salkil Lake, which is the study area, is a subbasin, and it is bound by two major faults. The rock types include Nysic Basement, Sandstones of Troncachua, Helites of Cheap Nataway Formations, and Alkali Red Granite. This map is the outcrop scale of the study area, first mapped by Christopher in 1993. During the field season of 2019, we visited the outcrops and trenches and investigated the main lithologies and host rocks. Speaking of the host rocks, the several trenches that we visited expose the three main lithologies that are host to the mineralization. Specifically, quartz-rich granitic gneiss with evidence of shear and strain, quartzite, and alkali feldspar granitoid. Mineralization occurs as three separate variants. Disseminated fracture-hosted calcopyrite. You can see calcopyrite fill in the fractures here. Massive quartz veins containing boronite calcite bulk infillings, and sulfide quartz breaches containing cadmium rich sphalerite, galena, boronite, and calcopyrite. Locally, the mineralization was divided into two zones stock work, hosting strongly mineralized quartz breccia and disseminated sulfites in quartzite and granitic gneiss, and shear hosted, disseminated calcopyrite and granitic gneiss in granitoids. You can see that the mineralization postdates the variety of the host rocks, and therefore it can be classified as epigenetic. In the field, trenches of the shear hosted zone expose area of heavily mineralized quartz breccia. You can see that this breccia contains quartz class, but there are no wall rock fragments, it is unfoliated and incohesive. The main trench of the stockwork zone exposes granitic gneiss, which is the host of the mineralization and you can see evidence of weathering and superficial oxidation. Here, specifically, you can see the presence of azurite and malachite. Petrography and mineral chemistry revealed major differences between the surface and diamond drill hole samples. Specifically, in the surface, the mineral sequence is boronite, rimming calcopyrite, and covalite rimming boronite. There is an abundance of base metals, minerals like sphalerite, galena, idiite, spionkopite, and yarrowite. However, in the diamond drill hole samples, the mineral sequence is the opposite. Calcopyrite is rimming boronite. 
There is an abundance of carbonates, however, no sphalerite in galena. There is also an apparent color difference in boronite in the core samples. It is important to note that muscovite apatote and adulary alteration is persistent throughout the samples. SEM images allowed us to further constrain the textural relationship between the minerals. Gang minerals were identified to be quartz, calcite, and barium-bearing feldspar. Major sulfides are calcopyrite, boronite, idiate, calcocyte, sphalerite, and galena. Secondary sulfides were identified to be spionkopite, yarrowite, and covalite, and accessory phases included fluorite, tetrahedrite, and apatite. But it is important to note that sulfides are consistently late. They are in filling spaces in quartz and calcite, as you can see in these images below. SEM and probe data revealed silver-bearing calcopyrite carrying up to 2 weight percent silver, silver-bearing boronite carrying up to 8 weight percent silver, cadmium sphalerite with cadmium contents up to 1 weight percent, and barium-bearing feldspar with barium contents up to 3 weight percent. The data also showed the occurrences of lesser-known minerals, such as idiotes, bioncopite, yarrowite, which are all common in shallow, low-temperature sediment-hosted copper deposits, such as Stavelot Massif in Belgium and Estella deposit in Turkey. Considering mineralogical and textural evidence, we constructed a perigenesis and divided it into five stages. Stage 0, the pre-veining stage, with first-generation quartz. Stage 1, veining, with second-generation quartz, muscovite apatote, and agillaria. Stage 2, major sulfide stage, with... Sulfides like calcopyrite, idiite, boronite, calcocyte, ditchonite, spalerite, galena, as well as molybdenite, silver, and fluorite. Stage 2, the secondary sulfide stage, with minerals like spionkopite, yarrowite, covalite, and the late surface oxidation stage with tannerite, malachite, and azurite. It is important to note that the mineral sequence in perigenesis for the core is distinct with boronite followed by calcopyrite and calcocyte, ditchonite. Distinct mineralogy of surface versus diamond drill hole samples is evidence of significant change in conditions. Oxidizing versus reducing conditions, fugacity change, pH change, acidic versus basic, since we do have carbonates in the diamond drill hole samples but not in the surface samples. So the pH increase could drive the reaction to form base and precious metals in muscovite, as you can see in those equations presented to you below. However, to precipitate the sequence of the major surface sulfides, the sequence of which you can trace here on the ternary diagram, the conditions must change. Specifically, the system has to experience an increase in oxygen fugacity. So mineralogically, this is consistent with the introduction of a neutralizing and oxidizing fluid, potentially meteoric water or seawater at shallow depth. CL imaging revealed three generations of quartz. Type 1, early magmatic high-grade metamorphic basement host rock-related fluorescing bright blue. Type 2, non-fluorescing, pre-mineralization, vein-related, replacing a red shady type 1. Both type 1 and type 2 quartz are associated with fluid inclusion poor areas, and they are indistinguishable in plain polarized and cross-polarized light. Type 3 quartz, fluorescing yellowish-green, is syn mineralization, fracture, and bracha associated post-dating type 2 and 1, associated with fluid inclusion rich areas and demineralization. Speaking of fluid inclusions, fluid inclusion petrography revealed three types of inclusions. Early aqueous carbonic to a three-phase inclusions, early aqueous two-phase inclusions, and aqueous vapor-rich inclusions linked to the mineralization and to type 3 quartz that is fluorescing yellow-green. Type 2 inclusions post-date type 1, evidenced by the trails of aqueous inclusions, seen in this image, overprinting carbonic aqueous. Type 3, the vapor-rich inclusions, post-date type 1 and 2. Summarized microthermometry data shows that type 1 fluid, associated with carbonic aqueous fluid inclusion assemblages, has low salinity, from 6.6 .6 to 7.5 weight percent sodium chloride, with minimum trapping temperatures between 290 and 300 degrees Celsius. The varying density of inclusions is evidence of relaxing and overprinting pressure. Type 2 fluid has variably low salinity, ranging from 0.7 to 5.7 weight percent sodium chloride, with minimum trapping temperatures between 160 to 360 degrees Celsius. 
Individual assemblages show narrow ranges in minimum trapping temperatures and salinity, but ranges from assemblage to assemblage show real variations in temperature, pressure, and salinity. Type 2 salinities are lower than type 1, but both fluids are not consistent with meteoric water. They are, however, consistent with a system experiencing mixing with dynamic fault movement. Salkel Lake mineralization is epigenetic, carrying copper, silver, lead, and zinc. Vein, vein breccia hosted, sin to post deformational. Calc potassic alteration assemblage and fluid inclusion minimum trapping temperatures are consistent with alkaline intrusion related system. However, mineralogy is more ambiguous and consistent with intrusion related or sediment hosted copper mineralization styles. Mineral sequence and fluid inclusion data suggests mixing of fluids involving the introduction of neutralizing and oxidizing fluid phase shallow meteoric or seawater. Fluctuations in pressure, temperature, and salinity are consistent with syn deformational style of mineralization. Uranium osmium age dating of molybdenite yields 1884 plus or minus 8 million years. However, preliminary results of argon argon dating of syn mineralization muscovites show weight and mean age of 1831 plus or minus 2 million years. So tentatively, there are at least two mineralizing events recorded at Salkild, with a 50 million year gap between them. Future work will have to resolve which intrusive and or deformational regional events could lead to the mineralization. Additionally, fluid inclusion and stable isotope analysis will help to better constrain the type of mineralization, estimation of pressure temperature range, and the source of the fluids. Future work will also involve comparison to other systems in order to identify the relationship to uranium mineralization in the area and final classification and model development. These are my references for your interest. Thank you very much for listening.